Hi everyone and welcome to chapter 19 genetic technology. This is my absolute favorite chapter and was my favorite subject in university so please don't mind me being really excited about what you're going to learn. In this particular chapter you'll be learning five different genetic techniques and each of these genetic techniques has its own function. I'm going to walk you through it right now. Number one we'll be learning polymerase chain reaction. In PCR um, the function is to clone and amplify DNA. Amplify DNA means to make many, many copies of DNA, essentially. Number two, we'll be learning recombinant DNA technology or gene cloning. This is to make many copies of DNA as well, but it also can make many copies of protein, whatever protein you want. And usually this is done in bacteria or in a eukaryotic cell. Number three, we're going to be learning gel electrophoresis. Think of this as chromatography but for DNA. So gel electrophoresis is to separate the DNA fragments according to length or separate different proteins according to mass or charge. Number four, you'll be learning microarrays. Now microarrays is kind of complicated a little bit but not too bad uh, but the idea is to identify express genes by detecting mRNA. So how do you know what genes are switched on in a cell? You just take its mRNA so basically mRNA is DNA that's already transcribed right? So you take the mRNA and you detect it using this technique and find out which gene is expressed exactly. Okay, so that's number four, microarrays. Number five is bioinformatics. Bioinformatics is actually widely used in bio at the moment. So it's like a hot topic, hot um, like feel at the moment for bio. But you learn a very tiny part here. And basically, bioinformatics is a database. It's collection, processing, analysis of biological info and data using computer software. So it's basically a huge database that could be found online and there's a lot of protein sequences and DNA sequences and you can compare them and use them in many many applications. That is the five techniques you're going to learn but I'm going to teach you a sixth one bonus. Okay, this is extra, this is not in syllabus. It is called CRISPR-Cas9 which is a very new, considered quite new technology and is not in your syllabus yet. But you need to know this if you're a biologist because it's an exciting discovery. It's how to edit genes and cut DNA at specific loci. I will go into the details when we get there. So first off, let's start with genetic technology 1, which is polymerase chain reaction. Now, polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, is used to clone and amplify DNA again. And uh, we have a particular focus here on tag polymerase, which you will find out what it does later. You need to know all the components that, you, that is used in PCR, as well as three different stages of a process, including their temperatures that I've included in these images right here as well. So, without further ado, let's, let's start. So, PCR, what is it for? It is to clone and amplify DNA. Again, amplifying DNA is to produce many copies of a length of DNA. It is very rapid and very efficient. Uh, you can use a very small sample of DNA to start out with. Just a little bit will be enough. And what PCR does is that it makes a lot of that DNA, make a lot of copies of that DNA in a very short time frame. Well, relatively short anyway. The components needed are these. Number one, template DNA. The, temp the DNA you want to copy will act as a template. Okay. Number two, tag polymerase. This is our focus. Okay, this is very important. TAQ polymerase. Tag polymerase is actually an enzyme and it's actually a type of DNA polymerase. But it's very, very special because it's actually heat stable. It means it can withstand high temperatures and do not denature at high temperatures. And that's because it is a special enzyme we have isolated from the Thermus aquaticus bacteria. Thermus aquaticus bacteria, okay, that's how the name tag 
came from, T and AQ, is found in hot springs. So this bacteria is found in hot springs and therefore it is adapted to these high temperatures and can survive there. Therefore, the enzyme we isolated can withstand those high temperatures as well. We will need it to be high to be heat stable because in PCR many different high temperatures are used. We will see the process later on. Okay. Number three, buffer. We need buffer in order to maintain a stable pH. Uh, this contains potassium chloride and magnesium chloride generally. Number four, we need four types of nucleotides. Obviously, if we are copying DNA, we will need the monomers to join, right? So we need A, T, C, G, all four types in excess so that we have plenty to, uh, to, to, to copy the DNA using PCR. Number five, we need primers. Now, primers are new to you. We need two primers to be exact. Primers are actually short sequences of 20 base pair, BP stands for base pair, and they are single-stranded RNA or DNA. It can be both. It, it, uh, it is single-stranded because it's meant to complementary base pair to the start and end of the target region for amplification. For example, this is your template DNA right here, and you want to copy this region right here. So you make two primers, uh, you can order this online actually, they send it to you. Um, and basically you make one for the for for to mark the start and one to mark the end. And what happens is this middle region here will be amplified, will be copied. Okay, so contrary to um your brain now going like, okay, so which one do I add first, right? Actually, we take all of this stuff, so five of these things you can see here, and we put them into a PCR tube. And PCR tube is actually like this small, like it's smaller than my tiny finger. It's a very, very tiny tube. And uh, we actually put everything in at one go, and then we put it into something called a thermal cycler. This is a machine that controls temperature and uh, can change it for you in cycles obviously and then we press a few buttons and we let it run and what it does is it does PCR for you so let's look at the process so the process of PCR has three stages number one is the denaturing denaturation stage or the denaturing stage um, it's where the strands separate this is what we refer to as DNA denaturation that means the hydrogen bonds break, okay, and the DNA strands separate, and the bases are therefore exposed. And these two strands actually produce template strands for copying. You can see how the DNA um, strand has separated here at high temperatures, 95 degrees. Just a reminder that hey, we have put everything into a PCR tube and then into the machine called thermal cycler, and therefore um, our enzyme here cannot denature. So that's why we need tech polymerase to withstand this heat at 95 degrees. The next stage is called annealing stage. Annealing stage is at 60 to 65 degrees, so the thermal cycler will reduce that 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 temperature after a while and this is when the primer is added into the equation right primers anneal okay anneal means to bind to a specific section of dna i'm not sure why my little animation there's not working hang on let me exit come back you can see it moving now yay so you can see how it binds to the single strand there and uh, obviously it's via complementary base pairing hydrogen bonds are formed between the primer and the specific strand of dna the role of primers is pretty straightforward number one is to bind to target region for application which i mentioned just now it really marks the start and the end of the uh, copy of the region that you want to copy right At Actually, the next thing is also that it also acts as a starting point for tech polymerase to bind. And um, that's because DNA polymerase doesn't start 
it cannot start itself, right? It only binds to double-stranded DNA, which happens to be these areas now that the DNA strands are separated, and they can only add nucleotides to an existing strand. So the primer sort of starts out, starts it out for the tag polymerase. It, it's a starting point for the tag polymerase. And number three, the primers also reduce the re-annealing of separated strands. Now, very often uh, after denaturation of the DNA, so these two strands separate, sometimes when we reduce the temperature, it can stick back together. But because the primers stick first, this, um, this makes them more likely to stay separate. So these two fellas won't join back anymore. Now, you realize that the temperature is a range, 60 to 65, and that's because the specific temperature actually really relies on the sequence of the primer. Now, that's probably more undergrad bio stuff, so I'm not going to go into the details, but the sequence of the primer does affect the annealing temperature. Just saying. All right. Last but not least, we are ready now to copy. So after denaturation and kneeling, there is extension. The extension stage occurs at 70 to 75 degrees. So the, the thermal cycler will raise the temperature from 60 to 70 degrees now. And this causes tag polymerase. Okay, this is its optimum temperature for tag polymerase. It binds the primer at this point. Uh, and then it adds new nucleotides to the DNA strand and synthesizes the new DNA strands. And these DNA strands are obviously also complementary to the template. And ta-da! Therefore, you have two new strands now after one cycle. Again, just a reminder that tag polymerase is heat stable. It has a very high optimal temperature around 70 to 75 degrees. And this is very, very important so that it does not need replacing each cycle. It can survive at 70 to 75 degrees. It can survive at 95. It can also definitely survive at 60 to 65 degrees. You can just put it in there and let it run. Now, this is only one cycle. What the thermal cycle does is it keeps it returns to stage one again and then there's two and three again and then it does it over and over again so that's why it's a cycle that's why we call it one cycle okay and um basically the process is repeated until sufficient dna is produced usually we run it around 30 cycles now the dna of molecules actually double every cycle you can see just now that um Within the first cycle, we have made two copies out of one template DNA. And if we continue this further, okay, you can imagine it doubling every cycle. So 2 to the power of 2 is 4 copies the next cycle. In the third cycle, there will be 8 copies. And in the fourth cycle, it will double again. It will be 16 copies. So the number of DNA helix copies made from one starting molecule after n cycles of PCR will equal to 2 to the power of n. You get what I'm saying? So, I mentioned just now that we usually run it 30 cycle. What is 2 to the power of 30? How many would you get if you just start with one piece of DNA? Let's start. So, I'm just going to type my calculator now because I can't remember the number. That is, my calculator tells me that it's 1073741824 copies of DNA just from one starting molecule there is one billion over copies of dna after 30 cycles this diagram shows you 35 cycles okay let's find out what is 2 to the power of 35 that is 3.43 3 times 10 to the power of 10 molecules of dna that is what 34 billion copies of dna just after 35 cycles because again it doubles every single cycle there is an exponential amplification Ooh, that is crazy now in the past i would really really um 
I'd like you to do a simulation on PCR using this little online game, but currently it's not available be because Adobe Flash Player has been discontinued. Uh, but there is a YouTube version here that you can watch, and I'll link it down in the description box below. Anyway, let's talk about its advantages of PCR. Um, again, it is a rapid, efficient, very efficient process. It's an only small sample of DNA needed to for the amplification of DNA, you don't need a lot to begin with. And number three, the process is automated in a thermal cycler, which you have saw, you have seen just now. But the disadvantage is this: you need to know the precise DNA sequence you want beforehand because you need to design those primers to mark the start and the end of the amplification region. Also, in a PCR, you only can amplify shorter fragments. You cannot. Um, you cannot really amplify very, very long DNA or like the whole genome of an organism. It's very hard to do that uh, because, well, the, the process doesn't allow for it. Um, to do this, we need to use genetic technique 2, which we will learn in the next video. Um, and that technique is called gene cloning or recombinant DNA technology. So yeah, that's the disadvantages right there. Every technique has its advantages and disadvantages, you know, like life. Okay, so the question is, right, so it can make more DNA. So how do we apply this? Okay, so the applications are pretty much endless. Okay, you can use this in DNA sequencing. DNA sequencing is basically to find out the sequence of DNA. And you can use this to amplify just a small amount of DNA in maybe fossils. So you want to find the DNA sequence of an extinct mammoth, for example. You just need a tiny, tiny, tiny piece of DNA. Or you can use a blood sample. Okay, maybe you want to test paternity test. You just need a very small amount of blood in order to obtain DNA and extract it for sequencing. Other than that, there is DNA profiling. So at the crime scene, you just need like a hair follicle, which has some cells for to extract the dna in order to amplify them in order to detect the sus suspects um, or victims dna profile number three it could be used in recombinant dna technology which we'll find out more about each of these later by the way don't worry about it we can amplify it before insertion into plasmid um, again don't worry about details we will do this later in genetic screening, uh, so if you want to check if you have a genetic di disease, you can uh, just use just use um, the primers complementary to the target gene. So you take a little bit of DNA from you, just a little bit is enough, small amount, right? And then you use the primers complementary to that target gene uh, that you want to identify, and you can amplify the target gene in specific. So after a while, only the target gene that has something wrong with it would be amplified, and then you can detect that using other methods, um, like gel electrophoresis. So the, the, the applications are quite endless here, so I didn't want to list them all in the, you know, the chapter outline. Uh, maybe you don't, are quite lost now to, to what actually PCR is doing, what is DNA sequencing, DNA profiling, what are all these words? I know, I know, it sounds very foreign right now, but calm down, by the end of this chapter, you should have learned each and every of these red words right here. Don't worry, calm down. Till next video, guys. Bye!